folks, thanks for joining me today. This is Dr. Emily Sherning with American Resiliency. In our last video, reviewing the recently released AR6 summary, we touched on the topic of killing heat. In our climate future, there is the potential for heat that will be life-threatening for many living things, not just human beings. Many of us are familiar with coral bleaching, where reefs have been badly injured or killed by warming waters, and that phenomena can be closer to home, too. In 2021, there was a three-day heat wave that killed billions of marine organisms off the coast of Vancouver. The impact of pure heat is a normal thing to feel concerned about when you vision the climate future. In this video, we're going to talk about thresholds for dangerous heat, and we'll look both backwards and forwards. We'll look at projections for killing heat waves in the U.S., and we'll learn about some research that has helped us to understand the most dangerous heat waves that ever hit the U.S. in the disastrous 1930s. We may have learned how to prevent continent-wide deadly heat waves thanks to the actions of the American agricultural community. This is an interesting story and you may not have heard it before. We'll talk about how you can take part in this work and help us all build resilience here on the ground. So let's get some important background. How hot is so hot you die? The number can be lower than you'd think. In a very humid environment, 95 degrees can be hot enough to kill you. That number goes up as the humidity goes down. So when we're talking about killing heat waves, in humans, there's some math involved. With marine species, it's easier to calculate because if you're underwater, it's always as humid as it gets. Let's focus in seagrass. That's a foundational organism for many coastal ecosystems, particularly here in the U.S., off the coast of Florida. There's many charismatic animals like manatees, sea turtles, and conches that eat seagrass. Globally, they have pretty tight thermal tolerance. Let's check out this figure. So this is a study from a biology paper that was looking at the upper thermal limit in degrees C of seagrass. And we can see that some of them that live like by Antarctica, it's kind of low. But if we look at the distribution over the globe, we can see that 35, which is 95 F, is pretty much where the upper limit clusters. So that number, 95 degrees, it's not that high, but it's really important to remember. And I think it helps us understand why we seem to hear more about marine heat death than heat death on land. The temperature for killing heat is lowest when we're in highest humidity conditions, and you can't get higher humidity than being underwater. When we look at projections for heat death in a warmer world, so this is a figure from the recently released AR6 report looking at risk of species loss. As we get into that purple color, we're looking at 80 to 100 percent of species being exposed to potentially life-threatening heat. We can see that at 1.5 C, we do start to see those risks emerge, particularly dense in Southeast Asia, but also here by the coast of Florida and in the Caribbean. At two, we see that expand by three and four degrees C, which four degrees C is not our most likely future. It is a pretty extreme scenario. We can see a very broad band of heat death around the equator. And you might wonder why this is. It's because around the equator today, we have daily highs in the 90s. Historically, there's daily highs in the 90s. So if 95 is the killing temp, there's not a lot of margin of error before you start to run into the biological heat limits of life on earth around the equator. I have seen on uh, permaculture channels uh, advising people to go to heat adapted areas, advising people to go to warmer environments nearer the equator since the plants there can already take the heat. I hope you can see from that figure, it's not such a great idea. Many of Earth's heat adapted living things already live close to the basic upper tolerances for heat. It's a safer idea for you, for global biodiversity, to bring heat adapted species north or south of the endangered equatorial band. Now, I know this figure is upsetting, but we're gonna go back for a minute and look just at North America. Look just where we are. If we look at risks to North America, to inland North America, look, these colors here are very different. We are staying, even in the worst case scenario, in these yellow colors, right? Where it looks to me like we stay, even in the worst case scenario, at um, heat exposure related death under 20% of species. This is a very different number, and it should be making you ask, why is this? Why are we looking so much more heat resilient in North America biodiversity? For a moment here, I want you to look backwards with me, not forwards, because almost 100 years ago, we had a decade of heat waves here in North America, in Central North America, that were worse than we expect to see in the next 50 years, even with climate change. And that heat 
It occurred before we put all this stuff into the atmosphere. This is like a pre-anthropogenic heat waves that were worse than we expect to see in the next 50 years. I can't stress it enough. We're living in a landscape where living things have already had to survive tremendous heat challenges, and we have living memory of our most recent heat crucible. Let's talk about the 1930s. So in the 1930s, everything sucked so much. These are the records from the National Weather Service set in July of 1936. You can see in Iowa, many places measured at 110 or above. Anyone who's been to Decorah can see that this is like horrifying. They normally have like an 85 degree summer. And up in Wisconsin, the temperatures were extremely high, well over 105 degrees, even up into Minnesota. This is the worst heat recorded then or since in these heat waves in the 1930s. And the 1930s were terrible. I mean, they knocked my family off our land and millions of other families. My great grandmother, she talked about the horrors of this time for the rest of her life. But let's look with another perspective, like not a horror perspective, but with an eye towards what survived. Let's go check out Medford, Wisconsin, which for those of you who have been kind of following along, you're going to see that we're in familiar territory here with Medford, Wisconsin. We can see the Menominee Res uh, Reservation. We can see Rhinelander. So you know that we're up at the southern edge of this great band of forest in Wisconsin. We know that we're in an area that really has a quite good outlook for both RCP 4.5 and 8.5 future. And yet we're looking in the historic memory of a heat wave that got this place up to like 104 degrees. And what happened? I mean, look around here, look at all these trees. Do you think all of these trees are less than 90 years old? I don't think so. They look pretty big to me. And they look like they wanna live here anywhere that people aren't actively cutting them down. When you're looking at those trees there on the map, you are looking at organisms that survived these heat waves. This ecosystem that we were looking at there on the map, it has endured enormous heat stress and it was tough enough. It took that hit of the 1930s and it kept going. Those trees are living things that we are able to go and look at today that have handled the heat. And we're not even talking about the plains yet. I mean, if you get out into Iowa, if you get out into native plants on the plains, once those plants have a chance to get their roots in, they're basically indestructible. You know, we don't think of ourselves like this, but in the central US, in the inland US, our landscape is powerfully heat resilient. The real question isn't so much why the 1930s were so terrible, but why doesn't it keep happening? As the world has gotten warmer since the 30s, why isn't that happening all the time? And the answer here is very interesting. It appears to be related to soil. There's some research that indicates the dry springs of the 1930s and the dust storms that came after weren't just correlated with, weren't just associated with the big heat of the summers but we're causative, that the dust storms caused the heat. Since the 1930s, more land in that area, the inland US has been put under cultivation and critically, much more of it is under irrigation. By keeping the soil tended, covered and irrigated, the terrible heat waves that roasted the American interior in the 30s appear to have been kept at bay. There are multiple lines of thought in the academic literature that have converged on this point. And it's a crucial insight for our warming world. And it means that the work that we do, tending the land, even in little ways, even the little things we can do to improve the soil, we appear to reduce the chances of intense, unusual heat waves. Even as the world has warmed, we appear to have done it. And we all know irrigation can be abused. Groundwater can be abused. But there is a potential for healthy, sustainable draw on groundwater systems. Looking at our past here, looking almost 100 years into the past, we do see some inspiration that helps us move into our warmer future. So let's stay on track. What are we looking at in that future in terms of heat waves similar to the 1930s as we move towards 2050? I got a great figure for you. All right, I said this figure is great and it is great, but it's also very complicated. So let's take a second to get oriented. So as we look down the columns, this is historical data and this is projected data. You notice a lot more red on the map in the projected data, right? Unfortunately, it's even redder than you think, because look, the scales are different. If we look at frequency of heat wave days, use in the um, historical contemporary maps, it's maxing out a 2% chance. In the projected future maps, we're looking at a 20% chance. So that sucks. As we look 
uh, across these three rows, the first one, let's make sure that I'm saying it right, is um, daily maximum temperature, daily maximum apparent temperature. So when we're factoring in humidity and stuff and minimum temperature. So it used to be that if you had a pretty big heat wave in much of the country, even if you had a high daily max and daily apparent max, it cooled off more or less at night. You had some nighttime cooling. I think that this is the most striking thing to notice is that as we move towards mid-century, looking at 95% plus heat waves, we're going to see marked decreases in nighttime cooling, particularly in this big band in the south here. That's very dangerous for human health. We can see that the daily max temperatures are projected to increase by 10 times percentage for heat waves over much of the area. And that if we look at where is there some protection and where is there some hope of nighttime cooling, we can really highlight two of the destination regions that we've talked about before, the Northeast and the Northern Midwest. If we look at the third destination region over in the Pacific Northwest, we can see that the risk of heat waves there is higher. However, we are aware that in the Pacific Northwest, we're talking about the best baseline outlook, but the most risk of natural disasters we see further validation of that as we look at this heat wave map. So that figure was looking at the odds of 95% plus heat waves occurring with a max temperature over at least a three-day span. In other papers using less visual models, they predicted that over North America, we're likely to see between one and three heat waves like we had in the 1930s, 99th percentile heat waves in the next 30 years. If we get emissions down, if we manage to follow historical modeling for the RCP 4.5 scenario, one heat wave under RCP 8.5, three heat waves. Those heat waves are not likely to bring mass death to the American interior. In the 1930s, people died, but there wasn't mass heat death, not on land. When you're considering scary scenarios, that really is one worth taking off the table. Normal heat resilience preparations should be sufficient to protect you, and I'm going to talk about those in a bit. However, when we looked at those figures, we could see that Florida, and particularly southern Florida, is going to be at risk for serious marine events. I'm sorry, I know the figure is scary. I'm going to pull it up again because the change in risk to southern Florida is particularly big. If we look at the southern coast of Florida, we can see that the percentage, uh, the frequency of heat waves that used to be really low, like less than 1%, and now it's going to be like 20% as we approach mid-century on all of these factors. Max, apparent temperature, and um, low. The low is going to be high. It's not going to have good nighttime cooling. So that's a very serious projection for Southern Florida. There, it's, it's likely that Southern Florida is going to experience serious marine heat death events by 2050. It's not an out there possibility. Off the coast of Florida, there are many seagrass ecosystems that are already struggling. The coming heat is going to hit them hard. The outlook is, is grim. It's a serious target for immediate conservation. The West Coast, it's worth noting, it doesn't look as rough for your waters. Uh, Florida, and uh, there's another hot spot in Texas off Corpus Christi. Those are the highest areas with risk for marine heat depth. With Florida's seagrass ecosystem, I think that we have to put that as the number one danger spot in terms of marine heat depth in the U.S. When we look at impacts on general health, both of humans and ecosystems, there's generally pretty good agreement in the literature. Extreme heat events, these extreme heat waves we're talking about, they're not as big a health hazard as a general increase in heat. Saying it another way, the overall increase in heat is more harmful than one big heat event. The most dangerous part of the predicted warming trends might surprise you, it's warm nights. The projected increase in warm nights is likely to have a larger impact on human health and living things than heat waves or increasingly warm days. As nights warm, particularly in the American South, and as we saw in that kind of scary figure, warm night heat waves are also likely to increase as well as, well as a general increase in warm nights. That's gonna interrupt the regular cool period that living things from people to plants have relied on for health and growth in that environment forever. That cool period in the night is when many of our food plants in the South grow, and it's when the human body repairs itself so it can work in the heat the next day. If you lose the cool nights, the resulting day-to-day -day heat stress is a much more serious health factor than a major heat wave and much more serious for crop productivity. But it's not something that's going to get as much publicity. It'll creep up on you, so it's good we talk about it here. 
When we talk about building resilience to heat, you're gonna wanna pick a location with a risk level you can tolerate. Take a second and think back. I know I said this before, but in terms of destination regions, the Pacific Northwest has the highest risk of major heat impacts of the three destination regions. The Northern Midwest and the Northeast have very similar risks among the lowest risk in the nation. No matter where you are in the US, no matter if you're gonna stay in place or go somewhere else, you need to budget for air conditioning. The costs have gotten down for window mountain units, their efficiency's gotten better, Air conditioning is critical resilience equipment. Backup power is important because heat waves do strain the power grid. And it's also important if it's over 95 degrees and you can't cool off, not to strain your body. You shouldn't go out and do physical work if it's not an emergency. Otherwise, you're going to have two emergencies. As a backup plan, you got to remember that underground space stays cool on its own. Particularly in the relatively protected Midwest and Northeast, most homes are going to have basements. Underground space gives you a very fundamental security against heat. And I wanna go back to this point we explored about why things haven't gotten as bad as the 30s. And that's because resilience against heat is also about the landscape. If we look at the evidence of history, we should absolutely incorporate as much sustainable irrigation as possible in our plans for the future. Our work should be to create rich soils that can hold moisture and sustain diverse life. That work on the ground, there's evidence it's gonna help protect us from the heat, both extreme heat, like that heat in the 30s, and the daily stress of increasing daytime and crucially nighttime heat. Plant cover is gonna help bring down the risks for all of those factors. Tree canopy is a particularly important thing to cultivate depending on your region. A good tree canopy is an extremely powerful form of heat resilience. The next 30 years are gonna bring many challenges. You're gonna hear about killing heat waves, particularly in marine environments in many parts of the world. It's pretty likely that's gonna to come to Florida and have serious ecological impacts. However, you gotta take this in as you're making risk assessment. You're a land animal in North America. Your personal odds of death in a heat wave are low if you make even basic resilience preparations and have even basic resilience awareness. For more serious and wide scale resilience against heat, we got work to do. We need to nurture exactly the kind of rich, biodiverse, food-bearing ecosystems that interest so many of us. They're protective for living things in so many ways, including heat buffering. The reason we haven't had heat waves like the 30s, according to theories in several branches of the academic literature, is that there's so much more land under irrigation. Irrigation can be a sustainable path forward if we monitor and use groundwater wisely. It's gonna be so important. The gardens, the food forests, the landscapes we start designing today, they have real power. They're gonna make a real difference. When we look at the 30s, look backwards, it's a time when the land was very roughly used, when we had many agricultural practices that just broke the land. And we haven't gotten where we need to be. I know that, but it, it used to be worse. The ways that the agricultural community has learned and improved, it's changed the outlook for America already. It's probably why the 30s haven't repeated. We can keep learning more and doing better. When it comes to heat, our work on the ground matters profoundly. We know this because when we learn our history, we can see that work already has impacted us tremendously and for the better. We're facing serious challenges, but there is hope and we're not helpless. Let's get ready.